Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have with us Dr. Satyajit Rath and we'll be discussing the vaccination program which is supposed to be unfurled very soon. Satyajit, the government of India has said that it is doing various dry runs. They're going to start the vaccination program of the health workers, followed by the frontline workers, and then those who have comorbidities and above 55. Now, if we take all the first two, the health workers and the frontline workers, that's probably about three and a half crores. So we don't really have final figures on this. And the health line workers are probably at least about one and a half crores if we take all the hospital to dispensaries, to the hospital staff, including the people who really run the hospital, keep it clean, give people food and everything. So you're really talking of a large number. But if you look at the number of vaccine doses the government has placed its order on, it's 11 million. Now, there seems to be a huge gap. 11 million is about 55 lakh of people against frontline uh, frontline plus hospital workers of three and a half crores. So how do you see this panning out? Do you think that this order is meant as a first shot and they will then start looking at alternatives? Or is it something else that we are missing in this picture? So um, I think this is a number of, um, shall we say, um, rate limiting points that are likely to be in operation. Firstly, despite all the brave words about dry runs and the COVID app and so on and so forth, um, I suspect with some sympathy that the government really is apprehensive about just how the vaccination program will actually roll out on the ground. You know, you everything the numbers are not going to be so high in the initial phases. And even now. then, it's going to be a massive exercise. And I think what the government is hoping is that in the first couple of, uh, in the first few weeks, glitches will become apparent and will become apparent at a rate at which the government can at least run about and find jugad fixes for them. And I suspect that that's part of the reason why the orders are being spaced out a little bit taking advantage on the other side of the fact that uh, um, this is currently what's being made available at the price by the Serum Institute in all likelihood. Although, again, we don't know for sure what the discussions are about pricing and the schedule of supply. Um, add to this mix the other uncertainty, which is that the ICMR Bharat Biotech um, Hyderabad-based vaccine candidate, Covaxin, which has been given a different kind of emergency authorization by the regulatory agency without any um, even preliminary efficacy data from anywhere in the world. Um, I think government is hoping that those data will come out and therefore they can then begin to use whatever small stocks uh, Bharat Biotech has available. So I think that there are um, jugglings and trade-offs going on where the government can be seen to have initiated a vaccination program but is not going into it at a speed at which problems will become major public relations disasters. You're talking really about what, for instance, has happened in the United States where a lot of the vaccines are sort of waiting in the in the refrigeration units and not being actually uh, going in for giving people shots. So there's been a huge criticism of the failures on that front. And uh, considering that we also have states, we've also have distributed mechanism for giving the vaccines. It's not a centralized military operation that the government would like to believe it is, that you are going to run into some of the same issues. Absolutely. So let me make two allied points here. One is a great deal of the vaccination dry runs appear to be based around the COVID app. 
the app is only as good as the connectivity of healthcare workers in far flung rural india so it's quite unclear what percentage of the potential first phase recipients are going to run into major difficulties it's quite unclear how efficiently four weeks later people are going to come back for revaccinations so there are many uncertainties in all of this one example that you give of uh, the uncertainties leading to um, credibility disasters for governments is of course the united states where supplies are getting bottlenecked another in a very different way is the united kingdom where the authorities started with arbitrarily expanding the timing of the second dose of the vaccine from 4 weeks to up to 12 weeks without any good evidence um, or more correctly without strong evidence there is sort of kind of preliminary evidence but not really strong robust evidence on the one hand on the other hand throwing all adherence to even preliminary evidence out of the window there seems to be now conversation about mixing vaccines in the united kingdom um and 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 that again is reminiscent of the indian regulatory authorities uh, opaque uh, uh, rapidity of uh, approving uh, bharat biotech's application for emergency use of the covaxin candidate so governments across the world are responding in ways that are as much about saving face and avoiding blame to the extent possible as about actually dealing with the pandemic so to put it slightly differently they are not dealing at a pub as a public health issue but as a political issue a logistical and political issue and saving face is could become a very expensive expensive saving of face if the pandemic lingers on because of the missteps we take if the vaccination doesn't really uh, take place properly we half vaccinate the people like is possible in the united kingdom now as you were saying and all the sheer logistical nightmare of being able to space and give a second shot within the period which is reasonable maybe 4 to 6 weeks but certainly anything longer than that as you said already the data is very thin so this is these are all the reasons you think government of india is going slow so let us do smaller numbers but be sure of doing it rather than have more numbers and then fall flat add to this yes but add to this yet another consideration um uh, let us keep in mind what the serum institute of india appears to have indicated namely that its price for the first 11 million doses to the government of india is 200 rupees a dose plus gst but that it expects to sell the vaccine in the open market for 1000 rupees plus gst per dose that's a five fold difference now um uh, uh, i gather from the media that the serum institute uh, uh, chief executive officer has commented that he, he, they are waiting to get approval from the government of india for open market sales add to this let us remind our viewers that pfizer made an application for approval for emergency use approval of its vaccine to the indian regulatory authority this so far has not been approved because neither phase 1 nor phase 2 nor phase 3 data are available from within india for that uh, for the biontech pfizer vaccine but given that that vaccine needs minus 70 degrees storage it was never going to be a a a, a practical component of a large scale public health care vaccination campaign response in india anyway so what was the driver for the application 
and a, and, and a reasonable interpretation is that the driver was in metropolitan India for the urban upper class, the Pfizer uh, vaccine would have been a straightforward uh, sale. Absolutely. And let's face it, that there is enough segment of population in India which can afford the Pfizer vaccine. Precise. Available. Precise. And what you have, you have already reminded our, our viewers a number of times in the past that all of these are for profit. And therefore, it's quite possible that uh, Serum Institute will uh, deliver private and the public effort in different quantities if the government is not careful enough to block a certain number of files, certain number of quantities in advance. And that's what Serum Institute has also said. If we don't place orders early enough, what can we do? We would have other commitments. And obviously the commitments is indicated are for the for-profit private market as well, because vaccines should really not cost all that much, particularly when you produce in such large quantities. But that's another story, maybe for another day. So what you are saying is also that we are getting now into the market issue. But just taking a sidewise step on that, there are also other vaccines now slowly emerging in the market. Of course, one is the Gamalia vaccine, which uh, Reddy's Institute has already also started uh, trials in India. Also, the Chinese two vaccines, Sinovac and Sinopharm, both seem to have very similar data, though the details of the data are not public. But whatever we learned from the Brazilians, from other places, it seems also in the range of 75 to 85 in that range, details aside. So we are really talking about what you said earlier. This, this, this virus seems to be a wimpy one and almost most vaccines seem to be working on it. So given that there are other vaccines available, what about the Russian vaccine? Is there any step that you can see in that in terms of trials? In well, terms of so that's an interesting point. Again, um, if, the, if, the if the Indian regulators response to the Pfizer application, to the reported Pfizer application, the reported response to the reported Pfizer application, since we really don't know anything from uh, the horse's mouth in any transparent fashion. But if that is correct, then Pfizer's application has, was not successful, presumably because there, are, there aren't even phase one, phase two data in country. And if that's the case, then the fact that an Indian company is actually doing phase one, phase two data for the Pfizer vaccine, uh, for the um, uh, Sputnik V Gamalia Institute vaccine, um, indicates that as soon as those data are in hand, within another month or two, um, that vaccine will be in a position to be licensed exactly the same way as the Oxford AstraZeneca Serum Institute vaccine is. Add to this a vaccine that we are all overlooking, which is an Indian private sector vaccine, which is the Zydus Cadilla vaccine, which is a DNA-based vaccine, which is also in clinical trials. Again, um, the media have not uh, addressed the progress of the Zydus Cadilla vaccine. Zydus Cadilla does not seem to have made a, any effort to, to foreground and publicize their uh, progress, but that's yet another vaccine um, on the radar. So there's a whole range of vaccines on the radar. Novavax already has Indian agreements and their vaccine is in phase three clinical trials internationally. Again, within the next month or two, we are likely to see preliminary data. I cannot emphasize this enough. All approvals we are seeing so far show perfectly good, complete, reliable phase one and phase two data Phase three data are placed only on preliminary evidence. Efficacy. So now that's the other part because there's a lot of, uh, I will say, vaccine uh, suspicion that is it safe? That the, this is really the phase three trials are efficacy data. And this is not so much, it is really not about safety. Safety, yes, if something comes up, it's a byproduct of it. 
but the primary purpose is efficacy. And almost all vaccines that are in the phase three trials seem to show at least the 50% bar is being crossed by almost all of them. We haven't heard about a failure as yet. Yes, although in the British Medical Journal, Dr. Peter Doshi um, has uh, had some thoughts to offer on that with regard to the BioNTech Pfizer and the NIH Moderna vaccines, um, where the trial data he points out uh, are, 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 are very narrowly identified and that raises questions about whether the efficacy numbers are in fact what the efficacy numbers are. But um, details of that sort aside, yes, that's uh, all agreed with. This is a major reason why the criticisms, for example, of the opaque and uh, hurried emergency use, peculiar unspecified approval that the Indian regulator has given to its in-house ICMR Bharat Biotech vaccine, that criticism is not intended on the part of any of the critics to say that the vaccine is unsafe, it's not. It's not even intended to say that the vaccine probably won't work because as we've said here, similar vaccines elsewhere, the, the Chinese one in this particular case have worked. The question is about the integrity and the transparency of processes of governance, of processes of official regulation. And, and that's really the point. what we have also said earlier, it's a credibility of the regulatory system, which is very important. Because if that fails, and for instance, we find it didn't work properly as intended and so on, then reviving the faith in the regulatory institution is going to be much harder. So therefore, it is very important that this, this regulatory process, at least the viability, the credibility of that process should not be disturbed. So coming back to the last question I had with you, you know, there is also, uh, there have been various claims on the Bharat Biotech vaccine that because it's a whole virus inactivated vaccine, it will work on the variants as well. Now, is there anything to say that the whole virus uh, inactivated by vaccine works better for variants than the other vaccines? Is there anything? No. There is no, there is currently no evidence to say that inactivated whole virus vaccines will work better on variants than the spike protein uh, specific vaccines at all. This is not the other way either. It's not that they are worse, it's not that they are better. At the moment, we really don't know. But speaking about variants, there's an interesting uh, point that we should be noting which is Pfizer has pointed out over these past few days that it has tested the most dramatic change mutation in the uh, spike protein of the virus in the so-called UK variant. We really shouldn't be calling them this. And um, I like what the South Africans have done. They've called it N501YV1 or V2 which is a smaller mouthful than VUI 2020-1201, which is what the British have called their variant. Can, can we make an appeal to them to give these variants simple but not geographical names that we can use the rest of us? Anyway, that aside, the U, let us call it the so-called UK variant. The so-called UK variant mutation has been tested by Pfizer on serum from vaccinees, and that serum works to neutralize viruses with that mutation. This is good news. It's small good news because keep in mind that the so-called South African variant has a number of mutations in the spike protein. All of them together, as far as I know, have not yet been tested. There are a couple of reports that are also both promising and cautionary in that many individual mutations 
seem not to be broadly escaping vaccine uh, efficacy, but there is a cautionary note because there is an occasional amino acid in the sequence of the spike protein uh, at position 484, for example, where mutations of at least certain kinds seem to cause trouble for at least some antibodies from some people to neutralize. So clearly, what we should be reassured by is that we don't as yet have a huge vaccine escape um, outbreak going on already. What we should be cautious about is that this is not the end. It's quite likely that as vaccination spreads, variants of the virus that are not easily and well neutralizable by the vaccine will become more and more prominent. And depending on the severity of illness that they cause, we might or might not need to develop next generation vaccines against them. So it is a part of the larger biological war, uh, so to say. I know you don't like these terms, but the evolutionary war between the microbes and us, which is not going to end in this year of 2021, but we will probably have a much better year with the vaccines than we had in 2020. At least that is the fond hope that people with comorbidities like me have. Okay. Yes. Um, it is quite true that I am disinclined to use the imagery of war in most situations and certainly not in this one. So I offer you an alternative image that's familiar in India of a crowded public transport bus onto which, or a crowded unreserved railway um, uh, train Goodbye. bogey, into which yet more people come in and they say, yaar thoda adjust kar do. Essentially, that's the give and take between an incoming virus and us. How do we come to a new balance of coexistence? Equilibrium, you say, but I don't think you would have the same equilibrium demand for smallpox. But <laughs> or for Ebola virus, absolutely. Exactly. Keep in mind exactly. that this is something we've been saying repeatedly about this pandemic for months that if this was Ebola, we would be in a very different and a horrendously worse place. And the social response and medical response would be very different or would need to be very different. But let's not you know, inflict a horror story in our imagination. There are some of them on Netflix already going around. So I think we leave it to the Netflix and other such streaming platforms to talk about such possibilities. Question is, good news as yet on the vaccine front, nothing to worry about as yet on the vaccine front, cautious optimism. At the same time, it is a public health issue. And if we deal with it like a law and order issue as an administrative issue, then we can run into problems. And the fact that the government has been extremely opaque, this can lead to problems of different kinds that people don't know what they have to do. They believe they're just objects. And if an open market release takes place, we can also see stampedes for vaccines and causing other kinds of issues. So as I said, cautious optimism as Dr. Rath has shared with us, but fingers crossed on how the rest of the procedure to deliver and vaccinate the people take place. Thank you, Satyajit, for being with us, clarifying some of these issues, and we'll come back again next week for this and other topics to discuss.